been standing for a few minutes just watching the movement of a mechanical structure that's commonly known as a nodding donkey. And it really does look like a donkey just plodding along. What it actually is, is a drive mechanism that pumps crude oil up from deep within the Earth's crust. And it's something that you might expect to see in Texas. But actually, this oil well is a lot closer to home. For this week's Open Country, I'm in Lincolnshire. And here's another two. And they're right on the edge of the town of Gainsborough. And they're here, dotted across the county, because of what's known as the Gainsborough Trough. <laughs> Just as I'm standing here, I'm joined by Nigel Bowler. And you take runs around this part of the world here on the edge of Gainsborough. Maybe, what, after a day's work at school? Yes. Teaching yes. maths? Yes. Yeah, yeah clears yeah, the can, head. Yeah. <laughs> All good. Uh-huh. And this is a, 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 a typical oh. route for you, is it? It's one of several routes I use, yeah. yeah. Passes, yes. and and if one of the other routes passes a different nodding donkey somewhere else as well, yeah. All right, so do you like to include these nodding donkeys in your runs? That's no, purely incidental, <laughs> but I do notice them. Yeah, they're a little bit of a, a landmark in the yeah, landscape, no aren't they? Yeah. Yes, and these two here, this is actually called uh, Gainsborough 6, this particular site. Well, we can't get in, Nigel, obviously, because the, the great steel, steel yeah, yeah, barriers and padlocks and things. So there's... Okay. There's no way you're going to get in. You can understand that. But we can see them quite well from here. And when you look at them, what do you think about? It's an apt description, isn't it, nodding donkey? It's a nice, simple mechanism. They also look a bit like those birds that drink out of a glass of water that you can tip up there. Yeah, like it's the children's toy. Like children's yeah, children's toy. It's that simple, nodding mechanism, isn't it? Mm. I quite like it. Can you remember when you first saw them? Yes, I thought it was really strange. I came to Gainsbury in 1999, and I thought it was really strange having these dots around the town there. But now I don't think anything of it. And are you, is that typical of people, do you think? I think so. I would hesitate to speak for everyone, but I think so, yeah. And, and why do you think it is that they're so accepting? Because when you think about what it is that they're doing, you know, drawing crude oil up and it being part of the whole petrochemical industry and all the environmental issues that might surround that... But I live in a pit town originally, that's where I come from, and that, you know, the pit heads and things are far more intrusive than this, aren't they? They're almost invisible. Yeah, well, well, they're relatively unobtrusive, aren't they? I mean, I think people, they're, they're generally set well back from the road. I mean, some of the others, I mean, this has to an extent, but quite a few are a screen of trees around them, so you don't really see them. So there's not much money coming into the local economy because of them being here? Not a lot. I would think it's small. Mm. It's not, and it's not controversial like fracking or anything, I don't think, anyway. Well, I need to explore that a little <laughs> bit just to find out exactly what's going on. Do you think it would be different then if the money that was generated from this activity actually became part of the local economy? There'll already be some sort of council tax as businesses paying, so it could contribute to the local council like that. And obviously there's some local employment from it, not very much, but some local employment, so it does contribute anyway. I think if it had to contribute more, then yeah, obviously people would be keener, wouldn't they? Yeah. You know, in this area, just across the river, there's lots of coal works, and that, that was similar in... The local economy only benefited from employment. From the wage? Yeah. Yes, yes. And because this is a process that, as you say, doesn't really seem to have many people involved in it. At, well, at first glance, anyway, there's not a lot of money coming into the local economy then. No. Hmm. Would you like to see them taken away? No. Sorry, should I say something else? No, no, I'm quite happy with them. Gainsborough is just behind me and I've crossed the Trent into North Nottinghamshire and I've come to see another of these nodding donkeys. It's actually stationary at the moment but I've come to this particular site because I'm here to meet Julie Barlow who's part of the senior management team of iGas. So how many are there of these nodding donkeys? you know, that, that you have control over? Yeah, here in the East Midlands, iGas operates around 80 well sites. The older sites tend to have one nodding donkey on, and that's because the wells are vertical wells. So they were drilled with old technology and they were just drilled vertically into the rocks. The more modern sites, we have fewer sites with multiple wells on. You will see four or five nodding donkeys because those wells are drilled vertically and then laterally. So the draining a wider area from a single site. So the technology of extraction has changed over 
how many years of extraction then? Well, the, the actual Gainsborough oil field was first discovered in the 60s, but really developed in the 80s. And how much is extracted out of a well? Across the East Midlands, we're averaging probably 1,200 barrels of oil. We produce gas here as well. There's a natural gas cap in Gainsborough. So is this good oil that you're taking out? Very high quality oil. Really? Yeah. A road tanker, a petrol road tanker that, that people see on the road every day, that's about 200 barrels. So we're producing six road tankers of oil a day that goes to refinery locally. And they are in all sorts of, well, almost unexpected places, I think. That's right. Because this oil field's been here for quite a while, what's happened is that as the town of Gainsborough has grown, it's grown around our operations. We've got an oil well in the middle of a housing estate. We've got a couple of sites that are on the golf course, next to the railway station, next to the leisure centre. So, so it really is embedded in the community in this area. So let me ask you then, Julie, how sustainable is it? Because it's on a very small scale, say, compared to offshore oil extraction. It is. I mean, this field has been operational for 60 years. It was originally drilled and discovered by BP. They sold it in the 80s as being unsustainable. It's still producing and it's still profitable today. Oil prices are obviously a big influence on that and we have seen oil prices fall dramatically this last 12 months. So now that these fields are still profitable, obviously more marginal, um, and that is the biggest influence because our operating costs are a different scale to the North Sea as well. So we have smaller volumes, but smaller drilling costs, smaller operating costs. And the money from oil production, how much of a benefit is it to local communities to have oil production in, in their place? Once we're into production, most of the, the costs of production, the operating costs, stay locally. So we pay rents to landowners. We don't own the sites usually, we, we rent them. There's obviously salaries. All our employees, like me, live and work in the operation, so, so that, that comes in. And we try wherever we can to use local organisations and firms. And if we have to use national organisations, we try wherever to use local officers of those firms. Some specialist services we do bring in, but again, they're, they're UK based. I'm just thinking that when we think of oil wells, we think there's an associated wealth with it. You know, like Houston and Texas, like there's so much money circulating around oil. And yet this is in, in parts quite an impoverished part of the UK. It doesn't really seem to add up yeah. in some ways. The big difference between the UK and the US is who owns the oil. Here in the UK, the oil is the property of the Crown. So we pay an annual fee to government, to the Crown Estate, to allow us to get the oil. The benefit of the oil is not to the landowner, whereas in the States, the landowner does benefit from it. That's how they generate that well. Yeah. yeah. I presume that the search is always on for new sites for drilling oil. The planning applications that, that are in at the moment are actually for shale gas. So it's, it's not the oil um, extraction, this is for shale gas. Um, and that's in an area where we haven't currently got operation. So it would be new to that, that community. The processes are identical. You drill a well the same way, whether it's an oil well, a gas well, or a shale gas well, or a shale oil well. The difference is the rock and the pressures and the volumes that you need to, to, to inject, to stimulate the flow of hydrocarbons. So some of the wells here, historically, have been fractured, but not using the same volumes of fluid, but the, the processes. So. Mm -hmm. so fracking is one of the technologies that the industry uses. It's quite an emotive word. I've come to the edge of Gainsborough. I'm in the Park Springs housing estate. And the most unlikely sight here, I have to admit, is right behind me. It is yet another of these nodding donkeys in full operation, just one, in a, 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 a fenced off area, very secure, extracting oil. Yeah. And I'm standing watching it with Malcolm Fry and Paul Hildreth. You're both men of geology, great backgrounds and, right. and, and histories of geology in your life. So I need to understand a little bit more about what the Gainsborough trough is that I've heard referred to. So who's going to take that on? Well, the Gains Malcolm. The Gainsborough trough is a, a, a effectively a deep part of the Carboniferous Seas. 
And how and when was it formed? It would form over 300 million years ago. The oil is formed from the, the breakdown of marine organisms, basically. The oil gradually migrates up into mostly sandstone reservoirs in this area. And these sandstones are porous, and so they can hold the oil within the sandstone reservoirs. And there it is trapped. Mm. Yeah. Until it's discovered. Until it's I don't discovered. know how and when they discovered the Gainsborough Trough. Do you know that? Uh, well, 1960s, yes. Well, it started off back in the, the end of the, the First World War when they started to look for resources within the British Isles. And how do they know it's there? Well, from seismic surveys where they, they send down more or less like depth charges and, and get the bouncing back of the, of the sound waves and they can tell what strata are down there. What they can't tell, of course, is whether there is oil or gas down there from that. Mm -hmm. What they have to do with that is to drill. So there will be lots of boreholes which would be dry completely. So only a, certainly a small percentage of wells tend to produce. But this one behind us now, quietly pumping away, is in the middle of a housing estate. Mm -hmm. People are going to and fro on the cycling path. There's the postman, you know, and there's an oil rig in the middle of it. Yep. Yep. So, but it's been there since 1960. Oh. Um, so the housing the estate housing was built around it. is probably, yeah, more has, has grown up that. with it, is more recent than that. So people are just used to it, I mm. suppose. It's been there since they were kids. And what do you think of them as you look at them, Paul? I think they're wonderful things. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's just there it is, just pumping away, nobody around. It's reasonably efficient, I would think. Yeah. Do you see below the surface when you look at it, in your mind's eye? Even I find it difficult to imagine what's down there, but uh, yes, I suppose I do. I'm thinking, yeah, it's coming a long way up to get to the surface, and all the things that it's coming through to get to the surface. Yes, yeah. yeah, I mean, all those different rocks. From a depth of what? A kilometre down, perhaps? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 1,500 metres, something like that. Yeah. The, the site that this takes up, um, it's mm, just almost the size of a football pitch, isn't it? With the yes. nodding donkey in the middle. Yeah. And a few bits of gas work stuff with taps and pipes. And in the middle of this housing estate. So people are quite unconcerned about its presence here. Yes, yeah. they are. But you passed something on the way here yeah, today. Yeah, the, there's a, a new oil well being drilled at a village called Lawton, which is about three or four miles north of Gainsborough, where a, a, a firm called Egdon Energy are actually uh, drilling a new well down into a, what is an offshoot of the Gainsborough oil field. It, they're, they're looking for a, an oil a reservoir in a sandstone and sort of sealed off by mudstones around it. And, and despite what you know, local people or people may believe, it's just a you know a standard oil well. This is this is not looking for shale gas. This is a, a standard piece of oil geology. They're just, they're just looking for a conventional oil reservoir. And that has been in the offing for quite some time. There was a lot of um, yeah. public reaction against uh, any drilling, wasn't there? And now it's happening. Yes, and I mean, there are people there now. Um, Anti-fracking groups are, are just outside the site. And probably no fracking will take place. Mm. Do you think if people had been informed about the processes of oil extraction back in the 1960s that they would have been protesting against the construction of these, albeit quite tiny little nodding donkeys? No, I don't think they would. I think people uh, in, in the, the 60s were much more accepting. Or less or, able And less maybe aware yeah. of, of what was involved. Looking at the site now, it's, it's almost a piece of industrial archaeology in that it's a very, by modern technology, a very primitive piece of machinery, but it's still there, working away. Not everyone in Gainsborough has a peaceful relationship 
to the oil wells here. And after talking to Paul and Malcolm, I've come a few miles north to Lawton, the village where they saw a couple of anti-fracking protesters. It's a beautiful site to camp on, even though it's a bit soggy underfoot. There's new lambs in the pastures and they're fringed by woods. And here is the actual drill site. They've got a sturdy 10-foot fencing all round it. There's security guards, they're all dressed in black. And they've got the whole drilling rig. And there are lorries coming in and out, so there's quite a lot going on. And squidged. Onto the verge next to it, we've got two caravans, uh, there's three small tents and a few odd deck chairs which are set round an open fire. The logs are looking a bit damp though. And among the four protesters keeping warm today are Louise Hammond and Daniel Ashman. How long have you been here, Daniel? Well, the, the camp's been here for about a week, is that right? A week, yesterday. We got here f uh, a few days ago. It can be anything from about six to to upwards yeah how have local people reacted to you here you've got a couple of caravans we've got a few caravans we've got a few tents at the moment we're hoping more people are going to come and join us we've had some local support as well people come they they bring some food they bring kind of what's ever needed to help sustain this you know we're going to get more information down here um, more signs, more information as people drive by, so that they, they, they can start to have a more, get more of an informed opinion. So that's why you've come here, to change local opinions? The community protection camp has been set up um, outside the drill site, which is doing test drilling for oil and gas. It's meant to be conventional, really to raise awareness um, a lot of the interactions which the villagers have had have been from salesmen. They're here to pitch to them, to convince them that this is all fine, it's all kosher, it's all good. They might give them a little bit of a, uh, a sweetener, you know, uh, sort of some money for their community hall or something like that. And they've not really done their research. And because of the 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 hierarchy of the political order, you know, they're following that tune, and people aren't getting uh, given all the information to be able to make uh, the, the decisions, really, based on evidence, based on what's been going on in other countries. So we're here really to, to raise, raise the profile, make it so people can't just dismiss it out of hand. Mm -hmm. Well, you say it's meant to be conventional, and you talk of sweeteners. The company drilling here, that's Egdon Resources, have specifically said that fracking will never happen at Lawton. As a grandmother, I have no choice but to be here to stop this dirty, dangerous industry. This industry is killing people. But locals need to be up in arms about this for their community. But because they're getting hoodwinked by big corporations and little bits of funding, they're turning the blind eye. You know, you're not just going to get one nodding donkey here. You're going to get boreholes here, here, here. If once these companies get a foothold in Lincolnshire, as they are doing in Cheshire and Yorkshire, we will not be able to stop them. Louise, you're from Scunthorpe. That's about nine or ten miles away. But your home is in Leicester, Daniel. So what makes you leave everything, your girlfriend, to come and set up camp here? I don't particularly want to be here. I'm a bit disgruntled about the fact that I feel that the interests of my health and my family's health and my loved one's health are not being actually adhered to. So I've got to do it myself. You know, I've got a life. I've got a family I love. We all do. And that's, and that's got to be the... the the motivating force behind our actions and we'll come up with the best decisions if we allow that to take precedent over a few thousand people's monetary benefit. I've come a few miles northeast of Gainsborough and um, I came along a, a long lane that sort of uh, weaves its way between the vast um, agricultural fields here. It was called Cow Lane. I love that places hold the agriculturalness of the landscape in the very name. And as I stop and get out of the car, there is in the air, along with the birdsong, this whirr 
and occasional clunk of these nodding donkeys. In this particular site, there's one, two, there are four. I'm with Verity Barrett. Yes. This is a place that you know from childhood. Yes, yes. Which is how many years ago, if I might ask? 26 years ago. Right. Well, I was born 26 years ago. Yeah. So. But, and how is it you come to know these particular nodding donkeys? This is part of a journey that we'd make maybe once a week to go and see my granddad in Market Raisin. So we'd regularly go past and it was sort of a talking point, especially if my dad was in the car, because he would always want to kind of talk about, oh, why are they called a nodding donkey? And, and they're quite fascinating. As you said, they're hypnotic, and the rhythm and the, the shape, and they, they would always remind me of kind of a sort of puppet. Although now, up close, they're so much more controlled than perhaps it, my imagination allows them to be. You animated them in yeah, your mind. Yeah into something comfortable yeah. and um, not to understand what their purpose was but maybe just as a playful thing in yeah. your head. As a child certainly I would not have thought about what they were doing you know it was more just oh this is strange oh it looks like this and kind of you make it silly and you you imagine things that they could be rather than you know thinking about the functionality of a thing. Yeah the extraction of the yeah. oil. We did obviously we didn't really know very much about the way that they worked or that the mechanisms they have in place because we actually when we took the scenic group one week we saw this flame and and we were sort of really alarmed thinking oh my god do we need to ring someone we, we got out of the car we were looking trying to work out you know what why is it there i mean it looked quite contained coming out of this pipe and and, and as it transpired that that sort of off lets excess methane and it's burnt off and that's kind of how that's dealt with to avoid any pressure and explosions but we didn't have that knowledge you know it's strange how these things can exist in in your everyday and that they're in your periphery but you don't stop and examine and actually talking about them now has made me so much more inclined to kind of research and think oh and knowing that there's 80 in the area it, it's mad you think about them now more in on the environmental element of them rather than the curious yes, animation yes. of them i know that there's a world of things to do with oil that may not be positive but i can still kind of find that kind of inner child that's, that's always on the edge anyway that still just has a happy memory and, and watching these do it's quite it's just so calming and the rhythm it's really really actually quite wonderful being here and, and hearing the birds hearing the sounds tuning into those and actually it's nice to sort of have the opportunity to just come and to listen to this and that's why I'm here it's not not on a journey anywhere else and actually giving it giving it some attention it's you know it makes me feel very mindful and you know like I'm actually paying attention to these things and giving them their their moment <laughs> and that's the last thing I would expect anybody to say you feel they're intrusive mm. and far from benign mm. but that's not yeah. how you feel as you stand here now really? Although they're in stark difference, things like wind turbines, like I, I understand that some people really don't like them. There's the whole NIMBY, not in my backyard. But again, I have this kind of, I really, really like them. You know, it's like a, a windmill in the sandcastle. I, I love how they look because I'm definitely the sort of person that I have a lot of guilt about things that maybe are far beyond my control. And But I do, you know, if, if I don't recycle a thing, I'll feel really like, oh no, all this kind of stuff. And, and it's not a worry when you're five years old. Mm. But with knowledge and understanding of the environmental issues mm. around the drilling of oil, extraction of oil, you still hold an yeah. affection for these nodding donkeys. I do. There is some guilt in me, but it's overridden, I suppose. I've got such a strong memory or I don't, a strong association with a, of a time, perhaps, in my life when things were very different and very carefree and, you know, I have my family and, you know, it's just a shared thing and it's nice to be able to talk about it. Sometimes you can't lose that, even even with a little more knowledge. Open Country was presented by Helen Mark, the producer of